Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Jose Garcia Moreno, director of the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination. Uh, just a, a technical uh, request that we have from our uh, panelists today. If you can turn off your video uh, during the presentation and then turn it on again when we have our session for Q&A, we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, ACTI, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, is committed to dialogue and collaboration amongst the disciplines. ACTI promotes diversity, interdisciplinarity, interreligious dialogue, and cherishes the advancement of the sciences and the arts within a framework of spirituality that, en that engages technology. ACTI fellowships are available for continuing tenure and tenure track faculty with a preference for at least one of the fellowships to be given to proposals from faculty outside the disciplines of philosophy and theology. Active fellowships also provide faculty with opportunities to complete a substantial research slash creative project or to concentrate effort at a critical phase of a research creative project that is consistent with the mission of the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination. Uh, such projects may take diverse forms, developing, critical, engaging, expanding, adding to, questioning, or explaining aspects of the Catholic intellectual tradition or its various concerns, or entering into dialogue with thought or imagination from the perspective of a different faith tradition or no faith tradition and using the resources of spirituality to understand and respond to present, pressing contemporary issues. One of such projects is unfolding the history and story of the Del Valle family vestments for which Dr. Leon Webers received the ACTI Fellowship 2019-2020, and which today is a starting point for our conversation. Leon Weavers is an award-winning costumer designer with productions in the United States, off-Broadway, and internationally. He was awarded a prestigious Fulbright Research Award to South Korea, examining traditional dress and performance. His recent credits involve work with companies such as the Hollywood Bowl, the California Music Circus, San Francisco Opera Center, English National Opera, Théâtre du Chalet in Paris, the National Theater of Korea, and he's also a national board member of the Costume Society of America and an associate professor at Loyola Marymount University. We have today also the honor to receive Cynthia Becht, who has closely collaborated with Dr. Weavers in this project and who is the head of archives and special collections at Loyola Marymount University, where she directs the stewardship of a wide variety of historical objects. The collections she oversees include the university archives, rare printed books, manuscripts, photography collections, also one of the world's largest postcard collections in the world, artworks and cultural artifacts, which include the 18th, 19th century vestments collection. We also are very proud to welcome Professor Cecilia Gonzalez Andrieu, an alumnus of both LMU and the Graduate Theological U Union at Berkeley. Among her publications is Bridge to Wonder, Art as a Gospel of Beauty. Professor Gonzalez Andrieu is also a member of the board of the Ignatian Solidarity. Before giving the floor uh, to Professor Leon Weavers so that he may start this presentation, I would like to say one more brief thing. According to St. Paul, salvation is a second garment added to and transforming the first garment, which only designates the body. In the, in the ascension of Isaiah, an early Christian writing in the 26th year of the, of the reign of Hesediah, king of Judah, it is written that they shall put on robes of glory and such shall be your garments, garments of life from the Lord of spirits. Thank you so much, Leon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Um, and before we begin, welcome everyone. Um, and I would like to take a moment to thank Jose um, and Emily Reyes for all of their work um, uh, in today and 
um, and the ACTI Foundation for the fellowship. I deeply appreciate the time and the support in continuing the research that started many years ago in a really unusual way, which we'll talk about today. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm really pleased to be here to discuss with my colleagues, uh, Cecilia and Cynthia, um, sort of the state of the ongoing research that we are doing, um, the history of these objects, including the Del Valle family, um, how this research came about for me. I had never planned to become a scholar of mission era vestments, um, but opportunity knocked. And so I entered the door. Um, and it's been a really wonderful journey of engaging my students, um, our students here at LMU. Um, and then we'll also talk about some future plans. And so, um, and within this, I want to say, especially that we're, I am very grateful to Cecilia um, for her uh, joining in this conversation today and who has talked with us and shared many ideas with us over the ideas of theological aesthetics um, based in her work and her methodology um, and, uh, and the books that Jose mentioned. And so I'm really excited that she's able here to help us contextualize the work that we've been doing. And lastly, I would say that I wouldn't be able to do this without Cynthia. Um, <laughs> When we when we started on this path many years ago, uh, which you'll hear part of that story in a little bit, um, it totally would not have been possible without her. Um, and it's I'm just so grateful that our library at LMU has such great librarians with which we get to partner, and that Dean Broncolini as well as Dean Alexander are both incredibly supportive of this work. Um, so. Uh, with that, I would like to turn this over to Cynthia, and I will start sharing screen here in a moment. So let me bring up the presentation. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Cynthia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Acti. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Leon, for inviting me to participate in what is essentially your fellowship. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here with you and with Cecilia to talk about um, a collection that I, I always loved, but never really worked with a lot until you came to campus, Leon. So thank you. Uh, we start with this slide because other than the campus nostalgia, I'm suddenly feeling looking at this beautiful, sunny, people, people populated um, photograph. Um, this is where the vestments that we're talking about live inside the library within archives and special collections, where we are honored to be taking care of, you know, real, real complicated California history, among our many other objects. We introduce our materials within our classroom. So if you haven't had a chance to see the Special Collections classroom in action before, this is what we're hoping we can return to someday soon where um, a lot of what my team and I feel is the magic moment um, when students get to have a hands-on experience with Special Collections materials. Um, we work with many wonderful uh, faculty partners, and they do, of course, include Leon and Cecilia. And almost anything that we take care of, we like to consider part of a teaching collection. So whatever we can bring into this space so that students can learn from it, this is one of my favorite spaces on campus. And we, we often approach our class visits with methodologies um, that are either deeply rooted in uh, primary source literacies from the archival side or leaning toward the, the faculty's discipline as we did with Leon's classes in many ways because they all, they all talk about the same things in, in different language. So when we were talking with Cecilia about creating this presentation as a conversation, we were delighted to realize that her language speaks really well to what Leon and I've been doing all along. So we are framing our conversation in the theological aesthetics methodology. And um, thank you, Cecilia, for, for introducing all of that to us as we keep talking. Yes, thank you, Cynthia and Leon, and of course, Jose and Acti and Mary Lou and everybody. Um, 
it was wonderful to see those pictures because those are all my students and it was it, it, you know this is where we we do the work uh, uh with actual beautiful objects so this begins with the idea that most people talk about art and religion as an intersection, the intersection of art and religion, the intersection. And if you like Google books, you'll see tons of articles and books on intersection of art and religion. But a while back, I, I really started thinking back to, during my dissertation days that um, that was just not a very helpful way to think about it because uh, I, if you see here, like uh, the, the intersection spots really small um, and uh, everything begins separately and then everything ends up separately. You just meet for a minute. And, and the outcome of that was that, you know, uh, theologians were very often just kind of looking for a theological point in a work of art and kind of, you know, just finding it there and then they were gone. And art historians were looking at all of the uh, form and everything else about a work of art, but then they were confronted by something religious in there and then they, they kind of acknowledged it and then they were gone. Um, and it was not a very helpful way for us to talk about such complicated uh, uh, objects and, and, and rituals and music and all of the things that express the interactions of humans with creativity and with questions of fundamental questions of divinity and meaning. So um, basing myself on the work of my dissertation director, Alex Garcia Rivera, who had written this word in, in one of his books and I, I popped it out and I went to him and I said, this is what we're doing. So if you move to the next, uh, we're interlacing, Alex, this is what we're doing. And, and he said, oh yeah, is that what you see me doing? I said, absolutely, that's what we're doing. And so we decided to name it this. And then he said, okay, now you go write the dissertation about it <laughs> uh, and, and develop this methodology. And so the idea with interlacing is that, first of all, each discipline can keep its own voice, right? So. Uh, we don't colonize each other's disciplines and reduce them, but we allow them to have their fullness. So here's all the beautiful art history. Here's all, all the, you know, archival material. Here's all the expertise in this case from, you know, costuming and theater. Here's all of these different wonderful threads and we are going to just weave them together. And theological aesthetics then is the way that we do this work of weaving things together so that we get closer to the artwork. And if you, yes, there you go. So I tell my students right off the bat, we're not going to ever say of creative works that we dissect them or that we take them apart or that we, you know, in, in some ways manipulate them. What we're gonna say is that we do acercamientos. And so we, we, we learned the word in Spanish meaning we bring them close. And we use these strands to bring them close to ourselves. So um, the, the strands, the four strands that I, I have found that are kind of, um, we can find this in, in, in all of the different religious traditions as we go through um, will be helpful, right? So uh, we have the strand of the work of art and I speak of art with a little a, it's not just things that are hanging in museums. These works, for instance, are now inside in a special collection, but that's not what their life was, right? So we have a lot of things that we call art that are just the creative making of people's daily life. So uh, the artists, the communities behind the art and the communities and influences in, uh, and, and the communities in front of the art, right? So we're gonna kind of uh, uh, do this throughout today as a, as a little bit of a, of a journey because my colleagues here uh, were building up really robust and amazing strands. And so we are going to do this live interweaving, interlacing right here with you. 
Okay, so thank you, Cecilia and Cynthia. So now we'll move on to talking about the art using this methodological framework. Um, and uh, I'll start with the sort of introductory story that Cynthia alluded to. I joined the faculty at LMU eight years ago and after my uh, Fulbright in South Korea. And at new faculty orientation, uh, a woman approached me and introduced herself and was like, I have things to show you. And I was like, okay. And, and this was Cynthia. And so we started a conversation and, uh, and she, we set up a meeting and um, I went to the library and she took me down to the vault. And as a, a costume designer who loves museums and as a researcher of historic dress, there's nothing I love more than a vault. Um, you know, where, where these objects are. So we went down into the vault and there she had these beautiful vestments um, in uh, drawers. And so I'll talk a little bit about each piece today in this moment. So this first set, <clears throat> is, um, and we didn't know anything about them at the time, very little. Um, we had some information on donors, um, uh, but so my first reaction at the time was very much in a way of seeing these objects for the first time. And this, this particular set um, really was one that spoke to me in many different ways. I could tell from the textile that it was from the 18th century, or I hypothesized that it was from the 18th century, given the pattern of the textile um, just with it itself, um, given and the history of textile um, uh, patterning. Uh, and so, but I was really fascinated by these objects together and how they were made and what they were. Um, I, of course, noticed in this first one, as here on the screen, there was some damage, uh, not only to the lining of it, but also down the center front of it. And so it provided with some really interesting things. Being raised in the Lutheran church, I was unfamiliar with, you know, all of the components of vestments. And so this began a journey of figuring out what that meant, what these were. And, and of course, obviously, I'm aware of um, their their usage, um, but really their meaning was a question that I continue to have. Um, and so this slide uh, shows um, the set and all of the components or many of the components of the complete sets as we're describing them, which would be the chasuble, the stole, the maniple, the, per, the burse, and the chalice veil. Um, the other sets so that we have in the library that are complete, and I use that sort of in air quotes, um, are these two. The center one is um, later uh, of the 19th century. And when I saw this one, I was really surprised about the different shape. And you'll notice that these three sets have very different shapes to them. And so that also posed questions for us. Um, in my discipline, the idea of researching historic objects of dress come from these basic tenets of what are you seeing? What are you, what are, what can you touch? What can you feel with it? How do you identify the textiles? Things of that nature, including does it have a smell? Um, and so, as I began to look at more of these objects, I realized that they also had, each of them had their own unique qualities. For example, the white object on the left, all of that embroidery is raised embroidery over either wooden or cardboard pieces in order to do this. Um, and then the, the loop uh, the, uh, the, the looped cord around the exterior of it and the interior around the grape leaves are all hand applied um, uh, uh, pieces of trim that go around. So this was one of these pieces that was, this is the most elaborately embroidered piece in the collection. Um, the centerpiece, which was really interesting to me, because of, in some ways, its simplicity. Um, there's not any, there's no embroidery, but it is very decorative. This object, uh, we 
it comes from the 19th century and is made up of what we call in my discipline, uh, a bizarre brocade. Um, bizarre meaning sort of unusual or very graphic or large. And through, through looking at this even further, um, most of the trim on this is machine applied. So uh, the invention of the sewing machine is in the mid 19th century. And so we're, we're aware that this was made by machine and had that technology available to them. Um, but what is also very unique and interesting about this piece is the, the orphreys that go down the front, the trim that goes down the front of it hides seams that piece this textile together to create a larger motif. So for example, in the center area, and I'll use my cursor here, in this center area where this large chrysanthemum is, if you were to split that motif, you can see the repeat. So it therefore creates a much larger repeat. And I can support that with the, here are the tassels and the ties that once it's split, you see them repeated over here and the, and the leaves coming out. So the maker of this very intentionally divided the textile in ways to create a much more um, dramatic effect than the textile had. These next three pieces also in the collection, the yellow uh, brocade on the right, on the left, excuse me, has this wonderful pink lining. Um, and also the pattern is repeated and used in a very similar way to the magenta one that we saw earlier. The black one on the right um, is uh, again, created in a very similar way, machine made, and is a black moire. Uh, fabric that's hard to see in this photograph. Um, and as a sidebar, I will say these photographs I took in, uh, I think two days in which Cynthia and I worked together and brought the collection up out of storage and just took basic photographs of them. So that way we would have a better representation of them to look at. And we'll come back to the photographing of these later. The chasuble in the middle is handmade, actually a combination of hand and machine. The, the trim around the neckline is, is applied by hand, but this is one of the most simple of the uh, chasubles in the collection. It is made of a silk damask. Uh, and so you can slightly see the pattern, uh, woven pattern into it. Uh, and uh, as opposed to a floating thread, uh, how the brocade, the yellow brocade is made. Uh, the last set that we have, complete set, is this one, uh, which uh, we suspect is also from the early 18th century, uh, I'm sorry, early to mid 18th century, with the floral pattern and the red lining. Again, another shape that is different than some of the others in the collection. Um, what's also very interesting about some of these uh, sets is the ties that you can see in this picture. Interestingly, when this when we first looked at this one, I said, oh, those are cape ties. So in theater, uh, whenever you have an opera singer or a singer who needs to move their arms and sing, there are ties from the back of the cape that go underneath. And so it was a very interesting thing to learn that a technique that we use in theater all the time has been deployed investments for a very long time. Uh, this brocade is actually a linen brocade and is very fragile. Some of the threads are unweaving. There's quite a bit of damage to it. Um, but again, it is, um, it, it is a floating thread brocade. Um, one last thing I want, I'm going to go back. I forgot to mention something about the, uh, the, 18th century slide um, chasuble here. Um, all of these are lined and have certain kinds of lining to increase the stiffness. However, the, the one with the yellow lining here um, is has many, many layers of, of parchment in it in order to stiffen it. It is an incredibly stiff uh, chasuble. And the way that we can see this is, um, I don't have a detailed photo of it, but there's a small tear right around one of the curves and you can literally count the layers of parchment inside the chasuble. Um, this black cope is one of the 
uh, copes that are in the collection, again, a morning cope um, uh, for the High Holy Days. And uh, it's a very stunning object that has uh, a belt clasp as well as um, uh, the, the cross on the center back of the hood is embroidered and has very small uh, silver paillettes that are hand appliqued in order to create even a more brilliant presentation. Uh, and then, of course, the, the fringed and the tassel that go around. Some of this is machine applied. This has experienced a lot of wear and tear over the years. Um, and the area where the belt, where the, where the clasp is at the neckline um, has a lot of um, damage to it. And then there is a detailed photograph below of the interior of it, where you can see some a, a tear um, <clears throat> in the lining and also uh, one side. So what this provides us is a really great opportunity to see what is inside of it. Um, and, and how these were actually constructed and the materials used to construct the inside. Uh, beyond the, uh, the front of the cope, the back side, it is just the velvet. This is a velvet cope, but the front two have an interfacing that helps to, the, the front aspect of it helps to keep it much more straight and, and hanging. It's a little bit stiffer. Um, these two copes, uh, also in the collection, are the two uh, sort of uh, floral copes, as we refer to them. Um, and they're both provided very interesting challenges to us and that we are continuing to explore. For example, the one on the left, you can see is almost a perfect semicircle, um, very classical cut of a cope. Um, it is made of two different materials uh, to show it, but there's also a patch uh, in the center back of it. You can see here, there's a different textile that has been inserted to repair it. And I have a detailed photograph here uh, down below. When you lift the hood of this cope up, you can see the brilliance of how clear and white and pristine this cope was in its uh, first incarnation. The, the hood has beautifully protected that textile underneath it. Um, Again, what is uh, some of the other interesting details of this is the bizarre brocade that it is used, uh, that it is made with, even with a, uh, a, a um, multiple uh, design. So you have the floral design, the latticing design, and then the, the subtle design underneath that is uh, uh, sort of, it's a brocaded dam damask. Um, the hood itself has great detail work in it with um, the central eye and the triangular shape that's there with embroidery around it and other, uh, other motifs, floral motifs. So by this time period, uh, within the history of liturgical vestments, Many things were moving away from, from illustrative embroidery. Now that's not always 100% true uh, to more abstract representations using floral motifs and their meanings to suggest things um, and to suggest meaning to the observer. Um, this cope on the right is unique in its comparison to all of the other ones because it is much smaller. It has obviously been recut over its lifetime. Uh, there are some uh, residual traces on the inside to show that this has uh, been recut and reshaped over time. Um, it's also interesting in that, uh, unlike the other ones in our collection and many other copes, um, that it is gathered right around the center back here. That also helps to support the notion that it was recut um, in this way. Other objects in the collection that uh, do not have partners or that are unmatched with things are um, the these uh, objects, which is uh, you know the chalice veil and the center object here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that actually is like a plastic. Um, um, cover that has hand painting on it. So this is a hand painted object uh, with little applique stones uh, in it. So uh, 
we are working to date this one um, in that way. And then, uh, then the other, there is uh, an altar cloth here, which has the, um, the lace and the tatting uh, on, at the edge, um, and then a few other objects in the collection. Uh, Cynthia, would you like to add anything before we move on from this? I think this represents um, our, our remaining mystery items because we have not um, worked with them closely in class before. So I'm glad that they're photographed, but among these are, um, and if someone in the audience actually can recognize it, even though it's not shown in, in, in its entirety, the upper left one which is um, lavender and on this side, but is reversible and has a beautiful green on the other side is actually a piece that we have not even identified what its function is. So the mysteries remain within this wonderful collection for us to, to continue to, to work out. Uh, and so Cecilia, would you please um, provide some context for us? Yes, well, as, as we looked at these beautiful objects and intriguing and mysterious, uh, we need to, to imagine encountering them in their own life, right? So, so when we look at art, you know, uh, uh, art scholars will talk about in situ, right? Where was this living? What was its place? Um, and so for that, I, I brought a, uh, a, a beautiful painting that has actually hung in, in exhibition here at LMU um, in a serigraph by the great John August Swanson called The Procession. And you will note there uh, at the very, uh, at, at the bottom third, uh, we have uh, several uh, priests, um, and deacons that uh, are vested. Uh, and we can see, right, that these are not objects. These are really part of the liturgy of the church. And John August Swanson being Mexican American, he, uh, he was um, inspired uh, to make uh, this beautiful painting, which the original painting is actually in the Vatican Museum of modern art um, the, um, by his experiences at Mission San Javier del Bac in uh, Arizona uh, and by the, uh, seeing the community processing out of that space. And so the, as we encounter the art as we have done, we want to then insert it in situ in its, in its own life and give it, it the fullness of its own being uh, before we in, in any way attempt to bring in uh, any of the other um, strands. I was struck by, by uh, Leon's use of the word brilliance uh, about the, the the more protected part of the fabric, right? And, and the beauty and the brilliance of these objects, right, would have been the thing that really stood out as they had their life within the life of the community. So um, let's see, what, what do we have next, uh, Leon? Yes, the, the close up of the detail there, um, which uh, shows us the uh, vested ministers uh, and the community's involvement in all of this pageantry, which has a profound religious significance, um, one that goes uh, back many, many centuries, but we're gonna talk about that in another strand. So we're gonna move forward here uh, to the question of the artist, the second strand. And when, when we're dealing with religious objects, very often the, the artists are unknown. And that's quite purposeful because first they're meant to be a community's creative making. Sometimes they're even uh, meant to be kind of mysteriously made 
uh, you know, did the angels, were they involved in the making? Uh, what, was there some beautiful divine intervention in the making of all this? It also, uh, religious works will often take centuries to be made. Uh, if we think about cathedrals and 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 uh, and frescoes, uh, so so this is a good reminder, actually, for for those of us who are moderns, that you know the arts very often in modern times get reduced to the artists, and we call things you know a da Vinci. And my professor in Berkeley would get very angry whenever she heard anyone say that first, because his name was Leonardo. And second, because you do not, do not call artworks by their makers. Um, so the, the artists are part of the picture and part of the story, but we don't want to reduce uh, any of these creative works to just the artists, because as John August Swanson himself will tell me often, there's things in here I never planned and I never saw, and and they just happened. So artists themselves are often surprised by the by the creative works that they give us. So we now turn it to that conversation. So thank you, Cecilia. So the artists of this, we have a scant bit of information about the artists who have made these and a hypothesis. Um, two of the sets, uh, two of the chasubles actually have labels in them. Uh, the magenta set and the gold set both have these labels of Francisco de, uh, de Cicero um, uh, made in Barcelona um, with a CFA uh, research grant uh, from within the College of Communication and Fine Arts. Um, after teaching a summer abroad class within the art department in Florence, I spent uh, a few weeks in Barcelona researching the origin of this and trying to find information about this maker. Um, sadly, uh, throughout the numerous um, archives that I did research on, very little information was found, partially because um, the one of the sources, uh, a fire consumed much of the information regarding um, uh, their collection. Um, but however, I was able to identify with the help of Anna Holmes at the Musée Episcopal de Vic, this one uh, advertisement about uh, this particular vestment making shop um, at the Plaza de Angel um, 8 and 9. Um, and so it talks about the making of the various different things um, uh, that they offer and can be purchased. This particular plaza is very near the cathedral, the main cathedral in Bar the historic cathedral in Barcelona. Uh, so after doing some research and touring the cathedral, I decided to go find the plaza and see what existed there today. Today at the same site, it is now a love shop. Uh, <laughs> so um, yes, so it is. It it sells something quite different than the than the uh, makers of the nineteenth century. Um, part of the other aspect of this uh, is. The notion of women's work. Um, and uh, very often in textiles and the history of dress, women are the creators of these things. Women are the makers of these things. And they have been for centuries, even the weavers of these things. Um, and so we do have some um, information pertaining to uh, the Del Valle women and how they supported um, the religious community uh, in Los Angeles of the time and some information that pertains to them even making uh, garments for uh, the monks at uh, the San Fernando mission. Uh, and we'll come to that in a little bit later when we talk more about the Del Valle family. But part of the collection that came from the Del Valle are these cloth bound, cloth bound prayer books. Cynthia, would you please talk a little bit more about these? 
Right, so we don't know whether the cloth bound prayer books came to LMU or Loyola University at the time before the vestments or after them. This is the only part of the Del Valle donation that we have um, strong dating for that they arrived onto campus in 1936. And we know that these um, belonged to uh, the matriarch of the family, Isabel Del Valle. And we have hypothesized it's very likely that she and her two daughters may have created these beautiful bindings um, out of the remnants of textiles that they had in their home. And no two are exactly the same. So um, knowing that they may have perhaps even sewn that, um, that one chasuble that Leon mentioned is partially hand sewn uh, and it could have been in the home and knowing that this was part of something that they produced, um, each of these little volumes, they're, they're tiny, um, is filled with maybe 15 little prayer books that are chat books that they themselves uh, curated. They decided how to organize them. They bound them together at home and with these wonderful textiles, unconsciously preserving a rich history of California textiles in use in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, if you look at the enlarged um, binding with the with <laughs> that's brown uh, at the bottom of your screen. It was only recently after using these for many years that I noticed that someone had left a needle stuck almost as if they had left their work unfinished. And uh, that has been part of that um, prayer book for maybe a century or more. And what's interesting about these prayer books as well is you can see, for example, in this image with the uh, the inside, the hand stitching uh, that is irregular in its form, this sort of whip stitch that goes around the, the edge of the cover, as well as even the hand stitching along the spine of putting these together. By contrast, the cover of this one um, ha look uh, has more of a regular stitch, more of a machine stitch. And that's important because we, in, in our research, we identified that the family actually did own a sewing machine um, at this time. And um, uh, I discovered a, in the archival research, a receipt and letter asking them to purchase the sewing machine. So, so it was very, um, you know, it was a very new technology for them to have in the middle of the 19th century. Um, so now we'll talk about the communities behind. Yes, so when we come to this strand, this, this is a strand that can send us in multiple and really exciting directions. Um, because now we're really, what we're trying to do is we're really trying to build the context as fully as we can for these objects or these hymns or these uh, other creative making of humans. Um, and so part of this is to reach as out in, in an interdisciplinary way in as many directions as we possibly can to look at obviously at history, to look at texts that may be getting played out, to look at other works that may be quoted, to look at all of the different influences. And of course, as we're looking at uh, the works uh, in, in this collection, um, the prayer books give us the, the big hint that obviously we need to go to Catholic sources. We need to go to the Catholic liturgy. Uh, I, I love the Del Valle prayer books uh, for their beauty and, and the inventiveness of the women. But I'm also very excited to at some point sit down with the prayers that they gathered and why they gathered them that way. And, and what those uh, uh, let us know about their prayer life and their faith life. So uh, as we look at, at these, uh, we, we also don't know what we're going to find. We may find 
some controversies in the communities behind. We may find ethical issues that become apparent to us in the in the present that were not there in the past, all kinds of things. So for, for us, the communities behind is a multi, multi and, and expansive space. And Cynthia is gonna take us into that. And yes, once more, we remember <laughs> communities behind here are the communities that were living with and using these objects. Thank you. For, for a library, probably the, the first um, and most immediate uh, person who comes to mind as a community behind an object when it comes to campus, to our collections, um, is of course the donor. And the donor, of course, is the benefactor who makes these materials possible for us to, to, to think about, to work with, to share with students. Um, our scholarly explorations are all because of her generous gifts. So I wanna tell the story of the Del Valle family um, from, the, from the angle of remembering that it was Josefa Del Valle de Forster who was our direct donor and was uh, in communication with the, the university at that time. Josefa was born in 1861 um, into a wealthy California family uh, the eldest daughter of Ignacio and Isabel del Valle. Her grandfather, Antonio, was one of the many Mexicans who settled in Alta California after Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. So that's where the family dates back their um, entrance into our history. Uh, when we look at the next slide, which is um, which talks about their descendants actually now that I'm reading it. Uh, the, the, the Del Valles have been a part of LMU story for a very long time. And many of the descendants um, that we see listed in this, uh, in this family tree that I think even though we encountered it at the Ventura County Museum, it must be part of the Rancho Camulos collection that they had been taking care of um, since the Northridge earthquake. Um, we have not yet explored every single name on this, but we know that many of these are uh, Loyola University alums and hopefully also into the LMU period. But this documentation, when I look at it, looks very similar to the provenance files that um, exist in uh, archives and special collections on our campus and really are the, um, the beginning points of our understanding the donor story and the community behind. So, so the biographical information I'm about to share was partly found in our fi files that we had partly in places like uh, the Ventura County Museums and then the broader research that you'll be hearing about when um, Leon decided to introduce students to this, um, this journey that we're all taking together. So the next slide is one that was from our files and also our postcard collection. And even though I'm telling the story of the donor, it is very hard to now look at a map like this and framing our, our presentation in Cecilia's methodological language, there are communities behind the communities behind that I've begun with. So let's, I'm gonna talk about the land a little bit. This is a, an image of the, the Rancho era and all the parceling out. But really what we're looking at is land that belonged to the Tatavium and Chumash indigenous peoples. These are the peoples who were removed from their lands when the Spanish Franciscans came in and developed the California mission system up and down the state. So the San Fernando mission, and that's the image of the postcard from, looks right around 1900 before it got refurbished, it is way down below this map and over the hills and over the mountains, thousands upon thousands of acres of indigenous land taken over for grazing pastures for the mission. And so when the Del Valle story enters this, there's already been 
an appropriation going on for a very, very long time. When um, this, this area fell to the Mexican government, Antonio del Valle for his military um, successes in the War of Independence was granted at first the administration of Mission San Fernando. And so they are very closely connected to the mission story at this point. And many of the vestments that um, came into the, the holdings of the Del Valles and probably to LMU, into our collection, may have originated from the Mission San Fernando's collection, as well as from La Placita, the early Church of Los Angeles situated on the plaza. This is where some of our, um, our wonderful materials come from. So after he received administration, he was also granted 48,000 acres of this grazing land. And that became Rancho San Francisco, which if you see where the red circle is, the larger parcel was Josefa's grandfather's um, area. Upon his death, um, Josefa's father Ignacio received the western portion. He inherited that bit and he settled there and called it Camulos after a Tatavium um, settlement that had originally existed there. So the family understood at some level um, the original owners of the land uh, to which they were settling. And that is the start of some of the communities behind. I think we can go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, Ignacio never lost touch with Los Angeles proper. And this is a small town at this point. And they maintained their um, residence on the plaza. And this is where LMU's story actually begins to connect with the family because I don't wanna go into the whole history, of course, of LMU's ancestor, St. Vincent's College, but very briefly, um, our antecedent began inside a home that was the neighbor home of the Del Valles, basically, um, the home of Felipe Lugo, who offered his residence on the plaza to the Vincentians to start a school. That's our beginnings. And this last remnant of Lugo House um, still exists in the university archives as our remembrance of this moment. Um, so the Del Valles live next door-ish, um, even though they had moved many miles away, there was a lot of traveling back and forth and they sent their sons to St. Vincent's at the school. And beyond that, of course, they, they, be, they kept um, sending their, their generations um, to us to, to be schooled. This is a picture of Josefa's older brother, Reginaldo, in his older age. Um, he, uh, he went through St. Vincent's um, through high school and then later on did his um, advanced studies up at Santa Clara. He eventually became a California state senator. And uh, when he returned to the Camulos area to Southern California, he served on the board of regents of Loyola University. So again, the family kept close in touch. When Josefa became a mother of two sons, she enrolled them in um, St. Vincent's at the time it was transitioning over to becoming Loyola College, Loyola University. And as a mother of alums, she, um, she, she was very much a part of our growth as we moved over to the Westchester campus and supported uh, that beginning. And this is of course where we, we understand that we became the recipients of the Vestments collection. I, I wish we could say that they understood how to um, think about preserving their own story, but they disseminated their story amongst so many different institutions, libraries and museums. And Leon is going to explain how he's been figuring that out through, through his work with his students. Um, but it's, it's not surprising to me that they thought of Loyola as a home for their, their religious objects, um, the, the prayer books and the vestments. This is where the vestments um, lived much of their life um, 
for, for at least half a century, if not more. This is Rancho Cumulos, um, where Josefa, our donor, spent the majority of her life because she was a newborn when the family, when the home was finally built and she um, moved with them over to grow up here. Um, I've seen that we have the director of Rancho Cumulo, Susan Falk, in our audience. So thank you so much for being here with us, Susan. You will understand this history better than anyone in this space today. Hi, Susan. <laughs> but we are we were very proud to to connect back with this wonderful place. Um, this is a postcard from our collection. And when you walk out of this house, just to the left of this image, uh, the family, the Del Valle family, had built their own chapel on their grounds uh, because they were, of course, were so far away from from Los Angeles and and from mission chapels and so on and so forth. They they had their very own, and this is where um, the vestments were stored and used. And priests would come and they would um, leave the vestments behind with them so that they wouldn't have to bring them every time they came here to conduct services for the family, for everyone working on the rancho, and so on. Um, Josefa herself was very interested in the ranching administration. Her brothers um, took over when Ignacio passed away, and um, her mother, Isabel, really became the religious beacon. Um, her deep faith uh, kept the chapel going, kept the vestments preserved, and really connects this collection um, to her story and to us. Leon, um, yes. So the, the Del Valle family could have existed as one of just any number of California families, um, rich, uh, property laden. Um, many of them, of course, lost their properties uh, because of course, Many things happened throughout the 19th century. There was a terrible drought in this area, but of course the most chaotic moment was when the United States um, went to war with Mexico and in 1850, um, all of this became American soil. So another land appropriation moment, uh, a lot of California families um, either uh, began to lose their properties, started to marry into Anglo-American families, um, but the Del Valles happened to be very good administrators and they also knew how to change with the times, I would say. And they were helped profoundly by an unexpected moment with the publication of this book. Um, Helen Hunt Jackson, the author of Ramona, had um, written an earlier treatise um, crying against the the plight and the and the American, especially the government's treatment of the indigenous um, communities across the nation. So she was already thinking about um, how to continue to present the the racism, the, the the terrible conditions. And so this book of hers that she was researching was was meant to um, present in a very romantic fashion. Um, what was going on in California with all of these different communities um, who had been connected to the land uh, and especially focusing on the indigenous um, first peoples. She didn't spend much time actually on the property of Rancho Camulos. I think she spent two hours one afternoon when the family wasn't even around to welcome her, something they were known to do to be very hospitable. And yet when she published this book in 1884, the details of the home and of the, the rancho were so identifiable to Rancho Cumulos that everyone suddenly, you know, word of mouth passed around that this is the home of Ramona. So the Del Valle family's name sort of became obscured when this fictional character of Ramona um, took over the imagination of the country. And uh, Rancho Camulos and Los Angeles itself became a tourist mecca for fans of this book. They, they came in droves. Um, they eventually drove the family crazy, but they, they actually, especially when the railroad was, was built right next to the rancho, 
um, people would spill out and, and come in and, and just wander over the grounds and expect hospitality because that's what the book led them to expect and, th and that's what the family produced. So the family's fame um, helped to secure their, um, their place in Los Angeles society. Josefa herself was a cultural influencer um, within a very, very large circle. Uh, they were really um, reaping some rewards from this unexpected moment. Um, this is a, uh, a later edition. We have a first edition um, of the book, but this is Josefa's own um, copy of the book from 1913. And in this edition, uh, the photographer came in and actually took photographs of Rancho Camulos because at this point it was undeniably linked. Uh, this family was really repurposed to be Ramona's home. And the family pretty much accepted it. So you can see in the, um, the next slide that even for their own agricultural purposes, this is the crate label that they created, um, they, were, <laughs> they were okay with letting the, the myth and uh, romanticism of Ramona um, keep, their, keep their businesses afloat and even thriving. So again, this is a family that once again understood how to work with the times and uh, managed to prosper. And it's a very recognizable Rancho Camulos shot right there. Leon, next please. Uh, this is one of the photographs that's in the 1913 edition of Ramona. So now you can see the chapel as it was um, seen in the early part of the 20th century not looking very different from what you can see today, we're happy to say. Um, the chapel itself is behind those double doors. So when you go to our next postcard, you can get a peek at what it looked like around 1900, around this fervor of Ramona. And again, no postcard will ever say Camulo's home of the Del Valles. It's always home of Ramona. Uh, we have uncovered research that suggests that the vestments themselves were probably folded up and stored in one of these chests around inside the chapel. So when we look at this postcard, we see what they meant us to see, but we're also imagining that this is where one of the, the collections that we love working with had their origins. Leon, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with the chapel? Um, no, I think actually you covered it. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 great. All right, so just to wrap up the family story until they come to us, uh, eventually the, the, the family did sell Rancho Camulos. And uh, you can go onto the LA Times historical database that the library offers and, and search the Del Valles and come up with all kinds of news articles because they were in the news quite a bit, the parties that they threw. And so it was big news for Los Angeles when the home finally sold. And we believe, even though we have yet to uncover the exact evidence of when the vestments came to us, that um, it had to happen sometime after 1925, 1926, as the sale was, was happening and after the home was sold. And again, the prayer books themselves were 1936. So where they put the vestments for a while, we, we don't know, but we are um, still working on uncovering those stories. And then they continued to, to work with Loyola University and send, the, and send their sons. But this is really where the, the Del Valle story for the vestments stops and starts with Loyola. And just before we leave this particular community behind, I just want to point out that um, there are many things that the Del Valle family gave us and are in the library collection. And one of them is a very early missal that had been used in the Plaza Church. So it's nice to see very early Los Angeles history from the Mexican period um, that exists here for, for us to see. And we're always happy to bring up these objects to anyone who wants to interact with them. And uh, along with that, I have to always say um, 
we, we call this the Del Valle Vestment Collection um, be, out of habit, I think, but I think its name is morphing. And that's the process of what happens with research a little bit because we've uncovered evidence that at least two objects, two of the copes in the collection were donated by people who were not among the Del Valle story. So this is all we have to clue us in that the beautiful black velvet cope, one of my favorite objects in the collection, um, was donated by Father Thomas English. Um, and again, um, Father Spearman, the, the library director of this time, uh, is giving us some clues, but these are his thoughts and guesses as well. So this is, this is our beginnings. And then the second clue is even vaguer for us because we have this um, old library slip that says white floral coat given to us by Mr. and Mrs. Emil Rossiter. Which one of these white copes is the white floral coat, please? <laughs> they both have botanical and or floral um, patterns. And I, I want to lean toward the top one, but we don't have the proof. So again, um, apologies if anyone from university advancement is in our audience but the provenance and donation records of over 100 years ago or you know, up to the 1940s are really slim and, and difficult to trace. Thank you, Leon. And when they came to us, uh, I know that Father Eng is in our audience. Thank you very much for being here, Father Eng. Um, if we have time in the q and I would love for you to tell the story of how you rescued the vestments because they would not be in the library without Father Eng. Uh, they were not donated directly to the library when they first came onto campus. They probably were donated to the Jesuit community for use. I, I imagine that that's what um, Josefa would have thought and hoped that would happen with them. The prayer books did come to the library first off in 1936, but the vestments themselves um, pick up their story again uh, with, with Mike Eng finding them boxed up, perhaps on their way out for, I fear what? I, I don't know whether they were headed off for destruction, for transfer to a church off campus, but I'm so grateful for his curiosity to open a box and find beautiful textiles folded up and decide these have to go to the library. So that's how they came to us. And they were, these are um, images from the old Vonderall Library for anyone who remembers it. Uh, and we put them into acid-free tissue and laid them flat within these wooden map cases. And there they remained, barely ever seen, even though they were right there in front of us, right by our offices. Um, Cecilia saw them when she first arrived in this place, but really untouched, unused, and we really didn't know what to do with them. Uh, until the conversations with Leon began to deepen. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Now we're going to move towards the communities in front and our encounter and what we've been doing with these and, and how we have encountered them now. So Cecilia, would you please walk us through this? Yes, and, and, and what a, a wonderful lead into the communities in front, right? Because the communities in front are a moving object uh, that get, it really complicates very much the life of a creative work. Um, you know, the way that people at that moment received something, the way that people in subsequent moments in history receive something and the way things change so much. And now with, with objects like this, where we, we have this moving of their spaces and this moving of their life uh, through different communities. So if you go to the next one, Leon, um, uh, Again, we want to remember, right, that religious objects, and these are religious objects, uh, were made for someone. They were actually made for multiple someones. They were made for a community. So the first communities in front are always going to take us back to those who first received 
uh, something. And and again, it's it's so you know rich for us to try to imagine these uh, beautiful vestments uh, alive in their space and being received uh, as as they would have been. So to kind of get us into, into thinking that way, we, we want to look a little bit more deeply at religious objects themselves. Uh, if you go forward, Leon, thank you. So works of art do work, uh, religious work. They, they, are, they are fulfilling particular functions. And again, uh, I have found that I can map these functions across religious traditions uh, globally, and they seem to map well in, in most of them. Of course, I work with uh, Catholic objects and Catholic theology, um, and but I think that we can imagine how these, these functions also work in other traditions. So the first function that they have is that they're going to transmit a religious tradition. That is their most basic function. They need to pass it down from generation to generation. They need to teach it to new people. They need to represent the tradition, right? So with these garments, uh, we are going to, to see, right, that they're, they're, they're transmitting. And we saw a little writing about that in, in that little uh, piece that you had, Leon, from the, uh, the makers in Barcelona, where it was, you know, these are made for el culto católico, right? For the religious cult of Catholics and for the what we call the liturgy, right? So, so it was very clear, right? We are transmitting the tradition of religious worship. And in this case, we're transmitting the tradition of worship that has all of these wonderful, um, you know, aesthetic objects, which which really we see uh, come big time to life in in the in the uh, uh, 11th century with an abbot in uh, in France, Abbot Suger, who is is the first one who kind of articulates during our liturgies, we want to first imagine what the liturgy is like in heaven, which is happening right now. And so everything must be extraordinarily beautiful and resplendent. And we must use all of the best materials of this earth that God has given us to then raise ourselves up to uh, the heavenly realm in our liturgies. So he's, you know, he begins the whole Gothic uh, cathedral movement, he, the Church of Saint Denis. Um, so here we have the descendants of that, right? They're traditioning uh, this way of imagining ourselves in the midst, caught up in the midst of the heavenly liturgy and living at that moment, all of us together. The second function uh, that uh, works uh, of religious art will have will be to wrestle with that tradition because they will need to reinterpret it for a particular time. They will need to reinterpret it for a particular people for the issues that are going on. And most of the time, a, a lot of religious works are going to be proposing new interpretations of what has been passed down. They're gonna reimagine things. They're gonna sometimes resist some things. And, and they're meant to reinvigorate the tradition. So just to give an example of this would be uh, John August Swanson's actual work here. He has a woman uh, among the, uh, the ministers that are vested in the liturgy. Well, he's wrestling right there with the tradition of the ordained priesthood being uh, uh, only for men within the Catholic Church in our in our uh, uh, present world, and and he's wrestling with it and imagining something new. So we can also think of ways that these garments may have been doing different things, bringing in fabrics that had never been used before, introducing the new world, um, and 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 new ways of being church. The third 
uh, function is, is the hardest one for uh, religious works to be able to achieve. And that's because it's so very, very personal to each and every one of us, right? Because it depends on cultural knowledge. It depends on what we call the memoria historica, uh, our remembrances and the resonance that these objects will have, right? So, so sometimes what will move someone to tears may not move someone else at all. Uh, but for instance, for Latinx Catholics, right, who continue to worship in and have living communities of faith in the California missions all across our state, these, these objects and these traditions are completely alive and, and bring us to, to a moment, right, of sacredness and of holiness. Um, so it's also when, when works achieve this function of taking us to these experiences of wonder and transcendence, we can start to recognize what classics are. And these are works that then start to transcend time and borders and, 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 and become global markers of a religious faith. So uh, this is the really hard work that these are doing in a religious sense and we're doing with their communities. But now they have different communities in front. And for that, our friends should take us there. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, and so after with all of this, um, uh, as, as Cynthia and I began to discuss this, uh, these objects, I said, I think this is a great class and I'd love to teach a class um, in sort of just delving into the history, a methods class uh, based in um, uh, several texts in my discipline that uh, um, uh, <clears throat> pertain to how to research them and then in my own experience as well. So we began by going into the vault and uh, looking at the objects in the map cases. Um, I taught this first class as an overload, as a choice, and um, uh, with a small seminar, these three students here um, and uh, another librarian to uh, in, in part along with Cynthia. And we started to take them out and just to look at these objects and see what they were and to learn about them. So in the uh, classroom, we would take them apart, look at them, handle them. It was a way in which I was able to talk with them about textiles, to talk about the different kinds of objects that we were dealing with uh, within a set, um, and uh, to for them to handle and manage these objects, which is a very rare experience for undergraduates in uh, in my discipline to be able to handle archival objects. Um, usually that is reserved in graduate programs. Within this first class, we also had several guests um, uh, who came and, uh, but we began this mystery by looking at some of the objects, uh, some of the documentation that we had um, here in the library. So the early California vision uh, mission vestments um, here again by uh, uh, Father Spearman uh, and a few other objects. So we didn't have a lot of information, um, but we had some names and we began to think about where they were and where to go. Um, again, so in this particular instance, as I mentioned, one of the visitors was Lee Wishner, uh, a colleague and curator who at the time this class happened was at LACMA. She is now at, at FIDM and the FIDM Museum. Uh, some of the other guests in this class at this time were uh, um, Father Alexi, who came and actually vested himself uh, to show the students how the vestments were donned uh, and put on for uh, not these, but his own personal set. Um, we then took a trip to Rancho Camulos. Um, and so here, it was very important once I started to do this research and learned that Rancho Camulos is now a living history museum um, or still a museum and an active site, um, I reached out to the director, Susan Falk. Um, and we had a wonderful phone conversation and met up at the Rancho 
Um, the rancho is situated in Ventura County, very close to Peru, which is the closest town. It is um, just out, a little bit outside of Ventura. Um, and it really is a place in which you can walk through, we would call it now a house museum. Uh, you can walk through many parts of it. They have things on display. Um, and we were able to learn a lot more about the family and the site through our conversations and our continuing work with uh, with Susan Falk. Or, um, and so the first class was in 2015. Um, and in that time, uh, Susan told us about the uh, somehow the Ventura County Museum came to help them uh, after the Northridge earthquake, and that then provided another lead that there were going to be things in the Ventura Museum. So the Ventura County Museum actually held a few things in trust for Rancho Camulos until recently when they were returned to their to the museum. Uh, uh, and since we've begun this, and Susan in the chat later on or uh, in Q&A um, can answer exactly when they came back. But Camulos has also built a study room for the archives that they have um, at the site itself. Um, on that trip, this is the photographs of the interior of the chapel today. Um, and we're able to see this. And it was wonderful to go and see this and take our students there to imagine what these vestments would look like in this place, in the site where they were used, to talk with them about how the functionality of these objects worked and, and why they were here and to put them in context with this. Um, and I think one of the most most interesting parts of this, or one of the most fun parts of it, maybe not fun parts, was as Susan gave us the key to the chapel to open the door, it was literally like this big. It was like 18 inches long, this giant metal key. Um, and she graciously allowed our students to open the doors of the chapel. Cynthia talked a little bit about this. This is a slightly out of context in terms of which community is here or there, but I wanted to put this here to talk about the circle of, that the Del Valles were in and the circle of their friends. Um, so of course we discussed Helen Hunt Jackson, but among the numerous religious um, uh, pre, uh, priests and bishops and other religious people in their circle uh, was, of course, bi uh, Bishop uh, Francisco Mora and Bishop Rubio. So Bishop Mora, uh, we have documentation that talks about him giving uh, sets of vestments to the family. Uh, uh, Bishop Mora was ordained in Barcelona and was from Barcelona. And so we are hypothesizing that the two sets uh, that were made in Barcelona, maybe his, We've begun to look at family letters and family diaries that are held in any number of collections throughout Southern California, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, to start to begin to decipher this mystery. Um, additionally, the family, as Cynthia pointed out, were quite uh, well educated and well known. They spoke four languages um, and were and hosted enormous gatherings of picnics uh, with 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 dignitaries. Um, and so they were a very profound, profoundly influential family in uh, of this time. Charles Lummis here is photographed with the uh, with the Del Valle women. Uh, Charles Lummis, the uh, famous and at times problematic uh, photographer uh, uh, of Southern California. Um, and so, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, the and again, this photographic book, uh, uh, which features a lot of Lummis's pictures, uh, is called *The Home of Ramona*. These two sets uh, were at the Ventura County Museum when we visited there in 2016, um, and I believe have been returned to Camulos. So, yeah, I, I believe we can also thank Charles Lummis for helping to. Um, retell the story of California in an untrue way uh, to romanticize an old Spanish California and recast people like the Del Valles as this old Spanish aristocracy when, of course, in fact, they were Mexicans and later yeah. Mexican-Americans. And so recovering these layers of 
who these people were. They knew they were Mexican. And um, unlike many other California families who looked down upon um, the, the newer immigration waves coming in from Mexico, uh, the Del Valles remained supportive of their own original communities. Um, but again, this is all part of the problem and, and the complexity that these vestments represent for us as we continue to, to work through what they really mean to to all of these people involved. Yes, and uh, and and in addition to that, um, as Cynthia has talked about the the original land of the Tadabim and the Chumash communities, um, you know, we have yet to begun to examine those ideas and the perspective of these objects from that perspective. Um, and uh, Camulos, Rancho Camulos recently reconstructed part of a Tatavian village on the site um, as a way to sort of recognize the 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 workers uh, on the rancho were uh, indigenous by and large as well as other Mexicans and uh, um, Susan can add more to that as that story progresses. Um, some of the many, well, the many collections that um, the family disseminated their their um, holdings to, their possessions to over in Southern California include, and Northern California, all of these listed here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, other sources where we have looked for research to help support are through, uh, so Santa Clara University and the De Sasse Museum have a very large collection of mission era vestments, as well as the, um, the other missions themselves. So we've begun to examine the collections of vestments at other missions within the state. Um, and uh, when we began to, when I began to do this research, um, the Autry Museum, for example, had just closed and we're building a new, um, uh, research room, and so I've yet to be able to go there. Um, and the Seaver Center uh, has a very large collection of photographs and letters from the family. Uh, UC Irvine has a small collection of letters from the family and some other uh, ephemera and paper objects. So this first class throughout all of this um, research and exploration culminated in an exhibition in the spring of 2016, uh, uh, curated by the students and uh, focusing on the, the matriarchal aspects of it and the, their devotion uh, in that. And so within this collection, within this exhibition, excuse me, we featured the prayer books, the vestments, um, uh, one of the actual garments of uh, the women, uh, letters and photographs from, from different uh, um, collections that we got on loan. In addition to this, Ramona uh, has been made into a film at least twice um, uh, in the early parts of it and filmed on the rancho. And so that also added to the fame of the family at this time um, in this way. And uh, so not only are the Del Valle's um, deeply embedded in the agricultural aspect of it, but now also part of the filmic history of Los Angeles. For any, anyone who doesn't recognize that, that little exhibit gallery that is part of archives and special collections. Um, we've had many faculty um, working with us to, to put exhibits that are curated by students. Most recently, Elizabeth Drummond, thank you, and Cecilia's class as well. So we are uh, always proud to see students' achievements displayed um, in our little gallery space. And thank you, especially um, with this image to Susan Falk again for, for entrusting objects from Rancho Camulos, including this beautiful bodice that may have belonged to um, Josefa or her sisters um, to our space for a full semester. One of the objects, you can't see it, it's in the far back, actually um, was first on display to us before traveling over to the Smithsonian where it continues to be on display for several years. So um, go LMU. <laughs> Thank you, Rancho Camulos. 
Um, so the second class that we co-taught uh, in the spring of 2019, uh, throughout through my organization, my I'm sorry, my membership and activities with the Costume Society of America, I was introduced to a textile conservator who had actually been doing quite a bit of work with Mission Era vestments because of her work at the De Sassé Museum uh, at Santa Clara. Her name is Elise Yvonne Rousseau. Um, her company in San Francisco is uh, a, a textile but other conservation specialist. Um, it is called Art Conservation de Rigueur. Um, and she works with three-dimensional objects, textiles, and all kinds of things for conservation uh, purposes. So Elise partnered with us and came to class and through this, again, another class that I taught as an overload, we uh, begin to began to teach the students how to do what we call sort of early uh, conservation techniques, HEPA vacuuming, how to do condition reports, um, uh, removing any um, any bugs or um, debris that might be on it. Um, uh, so the very just early basic stages of cleaning and preparation, including a complete rehousing of the uh, of the all of the sets um, out of the map case drawers into acid free boxes and acid free paper so teaching the students how to properly um, move these objects and wrap them in paper in order to do this. Um, and so here are a few more images of us moving things around, the students taking measurements. Um, Lisa Lawrence, the student in the center with the tape measure, after this class was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, hired as an intern at the San Gabriel Mission Playhouse to help them uh, rehouse and catalog their collection of historic costumes for so things that were used in performance technically um and this class uh these two classes as well um uh, cynthia lisa elise and i are about to present on this work um at the costume society of america's national conference uh coming up in may uh this is an image of elise here uh and i sort of debating things over the textile um, and students uh, completing the conditional reports as well as drawing them and making notes of any discoloration or other um, important things to for the metadata records of the library. Um, again, an example of these ob object assessment and condition reports here. Cynthia, do you want to talk a little bit about these? These condition reports actually represent a first stage of really beginning to process this collection, which ultimately needs to become more widely known. And so our archivist, Marissa Ramirez, I think is already also here, um, is taking the next stage beyond the students, but really the students working with the class and learning how to use the correct vocabulary um, were the ones to document what is actually happening physically with each of these. And we are using all of their documentation um, to move the collection forward into a digital space. That's one of the next steps that Leona is gonna be talking about, as well as to help us with a finding aid and just generally, finally really understand specifically what is going on with a collection that includes around 70 objects. Um, as mentioned, the storage, uh, rehousing, and um, uh, and uh, into acid-free boxes and tissues, and properly identifying them on the outside of the box. Part of the reason we decided, well, the main reason we decided to rehouse them was that the as the these are acid-free boxes. The map case, um, made of wood but also varnish, can off-gas and can actually cause damage to the objects over time. Um, so this class was filled with lots of interesting discoveries and challenges because of the combined information of all three of our experiences and our backgrounds, we were able to more closely date things and reveal some really interesting uh, information about these. For example, we now know that some of these textiles came from China. 
and were imported by the um, by, uh, by the Colegio in Mexico, where many vestments were produced um, for to be disseminated throughout the mission system. Um, uh, we also know that the Del Valle family imported textiles themselves um, in that way from uh, from other parts of the world. Um, and so one of the most interesting discoveries or questions that we have, uh, problems that we are exploring, is one of the copes. The small cope that I mentioned before, which is here, uh, we've been having great conversations with um, both uh, Mike Eng about as well as um, Elise around why this cope is so small. Um, and we have two leads in which we're pursuing to try to discover it. One is it was possibly used as decoration of statuary, which was very common for uh, objects of this nature to be recut and reused in actual decoration of statuary. Um, and the other, the other hypothesis and theory is that we are hypothesizing that this small cope may have been may have been worn or belonged to Junipero Serra. This has come through us through Elise and her research, which where they have and the work with Santa uh, the De Sassé Museum, they have identified other objects in throughout the mission system that were held and owned by Junipero Serra, um, and that he was an incredibly short man. He was a very diminutive man. And so a normal sized cope would have drug on the floor on the ground if he was wearing it. So um, and when I have measured the cope, this cope and the other uh, objects that were that are already attributed to him, they are very similar in size and in measurements. So um, this was what we were hoping to begin to explore more fully when I was awarded the ACTI Fellowship last year. Um, and many of the informes that hold this information are at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, but COVID eventually closed all of that down. And so these are two interesting theories that we need to corroborate or disprove or uh, uh, so they're they're lingering for us. One of the other things that um, uh, we have been able to do through my work with the Costume Society of America is completely digitize this collection um, through an organization, through our organization, and a uh, a pilot program called Digital Angels, in which uh, I and my colleague in the Chartreuse jacket, Mon Dr. Monica Sklar, who teaches at the University of Georgia, um, we are spearheading two projects through CSA. One in which Digital Angels is helping and learning and training collections in need around the country to properly digitize their photographs to establish digitization standards, um, nomenclature standards, methodologies, as well as metadata standards. Many of these issues are rife within the discipline of costume and textile history, because as you know, and many of you can think about this, there's more than one word for the shirt. Um, and so those different vocabularies become problematic. And in small collections where you may have a volunteer or one person who's doing it, those inputting data, the data will shift and change dramatically and often be unintentionally incorrect. Um, so in this slide, here we are working, we worked over a two day weekend with volunteers from the Costume Society of America students and we built uh, the support structures here in the upper right hand corner are students. That is a support structure uh, made of FOSS shape, which is a really unusual material that we use in theater all the time. Um, and it is inert. Um, it originally is sort of like a felt-like quality, it's very soft, but once it is steamed or ironed, it becomes rigid. And so it was the perfect support for um, the for all of the vestments, the copes and the chasubles. You can see it in the lower picture hidden below. So we started and we started just to trim them away to fit each particular object as we photographed it. Um, and Robert, I'm going to pronounce his last name incorrectly, Cynthia. Must, must, what's Wakaisa. 
thank you, um, uh, who has digitized things for the library many times, was our photographer and took some of the most stunning photographs of these objects, which you can see here. So if you can remember an hour ago when I showed you my sort of cobbled together photographs of these objects flat, um, being sort of like, uh, not so exciting, here through this work and through the financial support of CSA, um, we've been able to digitize these as well as through um, some work um, uh, from a private donor um, to both um, the library and um, the theater department. So digital angels took photographs of this nature. Um, so that way um, these could be used by scholars and moved online and could have very high quality, high resolution images to research and to look at and to examine these objects. And finally, next steps. Um, so I wanna thank you all for being along on this ride for us for this afternoon. Um, some of the things that we've talked about already are one, to prove and or disprove the Sarah question, the, the um, the statuary question, uh, to continue to find any kind of research um, into the makers in Barcelona. Uh, of course, as one knows, when you go on a research trip, you always find the clue on the last day, 10 minutes before you're getting on the plane. Um, and so there is some research that I still have to do at the Museo de Vic. Um, we have, uh, Delightfully, the chemistry department has agreed to partner with us in our next class, hopefully in spring of 2022. Um, and Elise will return and we will actually do conservation aspects and look at this through a textile chemistry perspective um, to actually work with chemicals that are non-invasive and um, and inert to help actually clean some of these objects and to remove some of that. Um, and then of course, because of um, the work that Cynthia and I have been doing as well as Elizabeth Drummond and others in our learning community this year on anti-racism and decolonization, we are looking, we want, we are thinking about now ways to decolonize these, how to look at these from a different perspective and working with Cecilia in this way to think about the numerous perspectives that these objects have and the meanings that they hold. Um, and then hopefully at some point we will continue with presentations and possibly um, publish. So I wanna thank you all for being here. And in particularly, I would like to thank all of these people and organizations for their support over the years of doing this. As we all know, it takes a village to do this research. And I'm deeply grateful to Brian, Dean Bryant Alexander and Dean Christine Broncolini, who at one point said to me, Leon, you've made more hay out of these vestments than I ever have imagined. And I said, I think there's more to come. Um, and so thank you all. And my deepest thanks to Susan Falk um, for allowing us to play and, and inviting us back again to uh, Rancho Camulas anytime we wish to come. So thank you all so much. Um, and with that, let I will stop sharing and we can open the floor up for questions. Uh yeah, thank you so much, uh, Leon. And uh, obviously, uh, I only have words of gratitude uh, for uh, as the depth and range of this presentation in my eyes actually represent the idea of interdisciplinarity and excellence in academic re research. It's not only beautiful, but relevant and crucial to understand the history of this city and that of this university. And in my eyes, it's like this, this presentation represents this full circle in education, is how research and imagination and reinterpretation that provides research actually, and the education that derives from it becomes alive in tradition, right? So it's, uh, in, in, in my eyes, is how LMU should be defined through tradition and innovation. So I just want to uh, thank you, all of you for this presentation. And just a little uh, announcement here from ACTI. If you are an LMU tenured or tenure track uh, faculty and have a project, please uh, look for the call for papers for the next cycle of ACTI fellowships to NT21 
2022. It will be great to support your work and showcase it as we did today with Leon. Uh, the applications will be made public soon and I can share in advance with you that uh, the theme for next year will be based on the relation between spirituality and technology. And also in a very timely manner, I would like to congratulate the Hanon Library and its fundamental contribution to this event, but also on receiving the prestigious ACRL Excellence in Academic Libraries Award. And also thank the Del Valle Family State for their extraordinary support uh, to this university through the years as our stories are so deeply interconnected. So uh, with being that said, please, uh, your questions, we're open to questions. Thank you, Jose, so much. Um, okay, so I see there's one question uh, from Manuel uh, Valencia in the chat. What do these 18th and 19th century vestments tell us about liturgy and ecclesiology then? And what does this say about liturgy and ecclesiology today? Um, Cecilia, do you wanna dive in on that one? Yes, well, many. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Manuel is, is one of our uh, distinguished uh, theology graduate students and also a deacon. And uh, he heads up uh, uh, the retreats at, at the uh, Sierra Madre, uh, the Passions Retreat House. So um, I think we, you know, I already brought up one of the questions that that is insinuated by any time we look at religious vestments, uh, which is the role of women um, in embodying the liturgy of the people, uh, and uh, the you know I think the 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 role of particularity is also that something that comes up but as we know you know. Uh, following the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, um, we we started to talk about the the liturgy not as a European liturgy, but as something that became something new and alive in each community with their own colors and their own sounds and their own life. And so I think that the difference, right? becomes evident in that, that, that now uh, we, we have a much more difference in particularity and, and colorfulness. Uh, and, and you don't have to be European uh, to uh, participate in the Catholic liturgy as some of the, the thinkers in, in, in around the Second Vatican Council said had been the way of the church for a while. So those are some of the things. Uh, role of women, role of enculturation, and new, new, new ways of imagining who we are and how we worship. I think the second question from Amy Woodson Bolton reminds me of some of my favorite discoveries with Leon in class. How do the vestments relate to lay fashion at the time, and how do they fit into changing styles or uses of vestments? Well, Leon's going to have the best answer to that, but I would say that. It was very fun to especially look at the 18th century uh, garments and think of their former lives because they may not have started out as vestments. In many cases, they are um, remnants of a community effort to, to donate as the next uh, fashion trend comes into the, the secular world to donate those very precious um, materials and textiles to have a second life within the Catholic church. So um, when we were with Elise, the conservator, and she would point to one and say, uh, that was probably a dress <laughs> at one point, and that looks like it could have been drapery. Uh, those, are, those are great moments when you just think of the vestments as being more than what you see now. Yes, thank you, Cynthia and Amy. That's a great question. So in the history of fashion, especially until the late, until the Industrial Revolution, clothing was often recut 
and reshaped uh, and changed from menswear, women's wear, but women's wear especially, because the skirts contained so many yards of fabric. Um, these skirts of this period of these periods often have upwards of ten yards of fabric in them, and so it was a very uh, and as the fashions and I was very uh, I suspected that as I began this research and it is that that these often began I assume that they began as other objects, partially because the patterns are so large the repeat of the pattern is so large except for the very earliest one which was quite small and so um, I was and the notion of the bizarre textile. Um, and looking at them. And Cynthia, since I have come to LMU and since our partnership has purchased for the library some lovely um, textile books um, from the 18th and 19th, am I correct on this 18th and 19th centuries, Cynthia? Um, late 19th. Late 19th. Um, that, um, that are actual samples of weavings uh, with uh, of the jacquard loom and other things. So you, we can actually see textile samples from those periods. But even looking at paintings and objects, um, you know, uh, uh, and and extant garments from earlier periods, you see these patterns and you see these floral motifs. And so I early on suspected that these were probably objects that were recut, donated, uh, donated, and then recut, much in the tradition of it. Because again, prior to the Industrial Revolution, um, the weaving of textiles were, was very often in the hands of women. Um, and they were um, the, um, you know, they, they were the people who negotiated how much they were worth because they spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours weaving these textiles. Um, and Elizabeth Whalen Barber's book, The Women's Work, The First 20,000 Years, note the irony in the title, um, is a brilliant foundation discussing the history of textiles created by women and how women managed the family and the family finances through this textile. So, um, so, uh, so as fashions change and you need something more elaborate or more whatever is on trend, those are discarded, but they become very useful and, and donations to the church in order to show one's devotion, but also to, to help you clean out your closet. Um, so. Uh, Kirsten Noreen has a question. Go ahead, Kirsten. Hi guys, sorry about my bad light in here. Um, I wanted to, to thank all three of you for great talks and, and really interesting session. And, and one thing that I've really enjoyed is the, the theme of layering and, and this kind of idea almost of a, a palimpsest that you have a theoretical layering that Cecilia was sort of introducing, the layering of communities, the, the physical layering also of the construction of creating one of these vestments. And one thing that I was thinking about um, was really sort of the repurposing of, of these objects and kind of the afterlives. Um, and specifically with the, the Chasuble Leon that you mentioned early on that had parchment that was part of the structure, yes. which I thought was you know, kind of particularly striking if you think about parchment as flesh, as a body and kind of the, 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 the sort of the presence of Eucharistic references, the presence of, of crosses on, on the vestments. And um, a, a, as well as a, it for the, um, the, the prayer books that you were talking about, the, the textiles that were used, were those vestments, do you think that were cut up and repurposed? And no, just regular. Okay, well then, then yeah. my tangent yeah, yeah. of like yeah. enfolding. <laughs> I mean, some of them could have been, but when you have a close-up feel of them, they look like they're from garments that you would wear. Okay. And there's a lot of the cottons and the silks and, and but there is some velvet uh, so that would make you wonder whether there was some church or ornamentation, but I, I don't think we can tell that for sure. But I love where you're headed with all of that. And yes, <laughs> the, the, the ch chasuble with the parchment is a glorious piece because it does have all that. Um, extra information that it's conveying and making you think about. And and yeah, and Kirsten, I want to sort of respond a little bit to that on a couple points. Like 
in the construction uh, in the 18th century, the construction of menswear often used um, newspapers and print and newsprint and vellum to create the structure, especially in the skirts of the coats. So very often you, when uh, if you're ab ever able to look inside of that garment, you will find in many, many cases, recycled, reused um, paper, paper goods to, to do that. And so, uh, with the with the parchment inside of that vestment, um, it's akin to it's along that same lines of those construction techniques around fashion. Um, but one of the other things that I briefly alluded to with that particular one, the with the small um, golds and the vestment and the parchment is the the center front damage to that um, we completely hypothesize is due to the cross that hangs down because it is hitting exactly sort of at the same point. Um, the movement of the cross uh, against that and the rubbing away of that um, uh, causing that to deteriorate over time. Uh, so so. Each of these objects has a story to tell and we are completely unraveling, and I use that term very intentionally, these stories and, and trying to, to gather some of that out of it. I would actually love to take these to an x-ray machine and see what's actually inside. Um, uh, because I, I just, I, I, I can only hold a whole a piece of fabric this big up and like peer inside to see what might be hidden underneath. It would be great to have like a repurposed um, medieval manuscript leaf used as the parchment fill. <laughs> um, so, yes. Um, we have a, a question from Anne Cortez. Go ahead, Anne. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to each of the speakers. This is just such a fascinating talk. And, you know, speaking of layering and the different strands, I just love how the different parts of campus all came together to um, to build such um, an amazing picture uh, for us of um, these artifacts. Um, so you really piqued my curiosity when you um, pointed out the photo of the vestments um, that you don't know the purpose of. And so I was curious to know, are there were different shapes involved? Um, and I'm wondering, are those all sewn together in that way? Or are there separate pieces that are together? Because it looks like a, a cope and then a humeral veil and a something else. And what is it about those that make them difficult to identify? What sort of um, unique features do they have that set them apart from the other pieces in the collection? Um, and what, what do you, do you know anything about the, the timing or the anything so, what yeah, do you have yeah, to go on yeah. at this point so well, go ahead leon <laughs> <We're both laughs> <talking at> you. <laughs> this is this is typically how cynthia and i were working together it's like and go um so um so part of it is that we haven't focused on them yet so let me start there that those are those are the the flotsam and jetsam of the collections, shall we say, uh, that we are trying, that we haven't spent much time with. But we did digitize them and photograph them, so we were able to sort of uh, preserve them in that way. Um, so they're not all sewn together in one. One is, uh, uh, I believe it is a, um, uh, 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 I think one is a burst, one is a, I'm remembering that slide, uh, one is a stole, one is, um, I think maybe there are two verses in that slide, Cynthia. Uh, but then there's this one object that we don't know anything about and it is this, the purple one that has this sort of pleated half circle around it um, that we've just not been able to really identify what it is um, and talk about it, nor have we really focused on it. So, so there's that. Cynthia, would you like to add more? Yeah, I also just want to say that as we are working with the collection and talking about it more, it is getting harder to actually call it not only the Delvaya vestment collection, but the vestment collection, because technically vestments are what you wore. And there are many pieces that belong to the liturgy, but are not actually part of what you would um, accurately call 
a vestment. So the piece that we haven't identified yet may not actually be a piece that was meant to be worn, although it has a look of a belt or cinch or something like that for an uneducated eye um, like mine. But uh, the vestment sets that we have, the, that first slide that Leon showed the different pieces, parts of those were worn and we call them vestment sets because they have the same fabrics and they're supposed to be used together, but items such as the purse, that's something you're carrying and, and it's, not, it's not technically a vestment. So what we're actually going to end up calling this collection and or how we describe all the objects inside of it may shift a little bit as our understanding grows. But Anne, that's a really great question. Um, I think we just haven't um, flaunted the entire image or that piece to the right person yet, but we're getting close. Yeah. Great. Well, I really hope you can, uh, that you're in touch with ORSP trying to get more grants so that you can spend more time um, dissecting all of, all of these fascinating and, and beautiful pieces. We are looking at that and we've applied for a couple and oh, good. we're looking good. at a few more. Um, okay, well, I hope to see you coming through my office again, Leon. And awesome. Or, Thank you. And <laughs> all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Susan, since you're here, I'd like to introduce you to the group. And Susan, thank you for coming. Everyone, this is Dr. Susan Falk, um, the director of Rancho Camulos. Thank you for being here today, Susan. Oh, sure. This was wonderful. And we have more um, textiles out there and more vestments, like you referenced earlier, that came back from Ventura County Museum a couple of years ago. They had run out of space, and they asked us to go bring this back. And fortunately, we now have a, a safer space to keep them in, but we could really use some help. So <laughs> bring those students back as soon as you can. Well, I'm actually really, the last time we were out, um, one of the most interesting objects in the collection was the unconstructed dress that you have. Um, and so, and the other few other textile objects. So I'm actually very interested in now sort of doing a comparison between those textiles and the prayer books, for example, um, and, and just pursuing this. So it's um, now that they're sort of a little bit more easily accessible. Um, <laughs> and it's right. always a great, it's always a great trip to Camulos, by the way. So. It's a hike, but it's worth it, right? <laughs> so, absolutely. So thank you for being here. Sure. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions or uh, I guess um, not a, a abusing of, of your time? If we want to wrap this up, Leon, would you have some final observations? Probably we can go around. The sure. Let's just three of you and make some closures. Um, I just really have and want to really thank um, Cecilia for uh, partnering with us on this and Cynthia for this, um, this journey that we continue on and Susan for being so open to us coming out and, and after the surprise of like, hi, this is LMU. <laughs> and so I just really appreciate that. And I appreciate all of my colleagues who are here today who have influenced this work in some way. Kirsten for suggesting I apply for the ACTI Fellowship. ACTI, the work that we're doing in John Sebastian's group this year, um, and just the really interesting conversations that I've had uh, with Elizabeth and Amy and, and all the work that Emily has had. So um, it has just, like I said earlier, it just, uh, it takes a village to do this work. And I'm so appreciative of everyone's help and support and conversation. You know, as a librarian and curator, I have to say what brings great joy, perhaps the greatest joy in my, my work life is to find faculty partners who really want to play hard in a, in a in the way that can completely transform our students' lives and experiences. So um, I'm just so grateful that there are so many faculty who are interacting with these objects and, and other objects like them in special collections and and giving me the space and, and the opportunity to watch how students respond to them and 
and just being in the, the presence of all this learning is what I think LMU is about for me. So thank you all. Very cool. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, please uh, keep on following us. Uh, we have a fascinating symposium that is coming soon. Uh, it's the Paradox Symposium. Uh, we will, I'm sure you will receive some communication from us. Thank you again. And I hope to see you in the flesh very soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for a great presentation. Good to be with you.